Welcome to this rousing edition of After Impact. We're going deep on my boy, Peter Diamandis, and I'm your host, Tom Bilyeu. And I am here with the legend, oh, Agent the legend. Smith. Mr. Bilyeu. What is up, my surfing friend? How are you doing today? Doing great. You I'm know in. why? Why? Because we refreshed the store. Yes, store we did. Store relaunch. Yes, we did. Everybody. And can I just say, so mad kudos to the team here. So this you was guys, a big team effort. A, big team effort. B, you guys like just took care of it, rocked it, and worked your mojo. You rallied the, not only the normal um, Secret 7. I don't know why I said Secret. I guess SS. But, uh, ooh, God, bad initials. Nope. We're changing. <laughs> that was never a nickname we decided on. <laughs> <laughs> but also you rallied the intern army which is amazing you it's got these powerful guys. force the entire powerful army. force and in fact didn't chase design one of the new shirts this shirt that i'm wearing boom so, so and it's got the some full, yeah, this is what we're calling the impact theory surf style shirt why why are we calling it the surf a lot style of shirt? surf style shirts kind of and like, like what camera is actually capturing what you're doing know, right now there it is aim aim there it is there it is there it is perfect all right we got it um, because a lot Love of surf it. shirts have like the logo and then the okay. full brand in the back. Got it. Just hit the mic. Um, I love this shirt. This is a great one. It's, it's now available one. on the store. It's now available. Shop.impacttheory.com. Please go check it out. We have a ton of new merch, actually. We should show some. So yeah, this shirt, is one. Toughen the fuck up, buttercup. That's what that hashtag, hashtag. means. TTFUBC. Get on it. Get it and then uh, we have some other shirts. Our intern army and our team. You guys want to come it's out supposed here? to be mobilizing here. We yeah. rehearsed this. Let's get out Damn of here. Damn it. What's happening? In fact, the whole team that worked on this relaunch. <laughs> really should come just come out. Love, LC. Let's go, homie. LC's she's gonna like, come out. She's literally Molly's refusing come to come out because she's not wearing one of the shirts. She's all. Yeah, we got hey, Chase hey, here. Get it designed done. designed this shirt. Come on, Percocet. What are you doing? Tomorrow. Molly got Percocet. Will. Come on, come on. I'm actually going to take a real quick break, uh, a, and you got to get that, that jacket in here. I wish that jacket was Impact Theory, I'll tell you that. Yeah, blazer, that'd be cool. So Cindy's not Show not off the around. Momentum Matters shirt. Yeah, matters. Boom, there it is. Looking good. Looking sharp, everybody. We don't have all the shirts on display right now, but if you go to shop.impacttheory.com, you can see them all. You check Plus, it out. Plus, mugs. Yeah. Indeed. Nice. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> What would it take? There it is. Have a sip. Mm. Have a sip. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to have that conversation. Awesome. Uh, cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Good to see all the shirts. And I'm going to laugh if most of those shirts were actually out of frame because they're too tall. Yeah. That, that'll be, that'll be hilarious. That'll be a lesson for us. Uh, so, yeah. All right. We should probably dive in now. We should. Let's do it. Peter Diamandis, for those of you who don't know, is a serial entrepreneur. He's the author of the books Bold and Abundance. He's the founder of the XPRIZE organization and Singularity University. He's launched a number of successful businesses, and his next ventures involve figuring out um, how we can live forever and mining asteroids. So needless to say, he goes big. Yeah, that, that is very true about Peter. And he's one of those guys that really pushes you to think like how do you really take it to the next level and I remember when we were like we were having all the success at Quest and was just growing so fast and everyone was always asking me like oh my gosh like how have you guys like had the guts to like talk about any metabolic disease and like and Peter was like no but what's your moonshot and I was like <laughs> Peter, like it, yeah. that, that's pretty big and, and really pushed me to start thinking about impacting the entire food chain and like, mm -hmm. what does it look like to really change the way that people are sourcing ingredients and really going all the way back and how do you 10X all of that? And I, I love that about him. It, yeah, you guys are really pretty, like that. You guys know each other very well now. You're pretty good friends. Yeah, Pete, like legitimately, like Peter's one of those guys. It's not like uh, just a... Uh, what would you, like a social friend or an acquaintance yeah. that you round to a friend. I, I know Peter well. That's awesome. So, so yeah. tell us about what the XPRIZE organization is because I know you're involved with that. Yeah, so on the um, innovation board of the XPRIZE, and the XPRIZE is all about solving the world's grandest challenges by doing incentive prizes. So Peter had read a book called The Spirit of St. Louis, which was about Lindbergh's crossing the Atlantic. I'm almost certain I have not read the book. Okay. Um, and I certainly didn't know that that was incentivized by a prize. And so there was this guy that he grew up in Paris and he was 
if I'm not mistaken, like the equivalent back then of a billionaire. So I don't know if he actually had a billion dollars, but so he had moved to New York. And so he wanted to be able to travel home uh, more easily than a boat. And so Uh he created this prize so that he could, and that's why it was from uh, New York to Paris. And, or I think it was Paris, but anyway, France. And he did that because that's where he wanted to fly. And so people ended up spending, I don't know, hundreds, it was like $400,000 to win a $40,000 prize. And so Peter had written in the margins, like people spent 10 times the amount to solve the puzzle than the person was on the hook to pay out. Mm -hmm. And so he thought this could be a really interesting way to incentivize space. And so finding a way to um, incentivize private individuals. So rather than being beholden to the government, incentivizing a private individual to solve the problem. And so that was the launch of the X Prize, which gave birth to the company that Virgin bought and turned into Virgin Galactic. And it was won by Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft. And the guy, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's one of the most famous um, aerospace engineers like on the planet. And they came in secretly. Uh, certainly, Paul Allen was a secret, and just because they wanted to see if they could pull it off. Yeah. And I think they actually spent more than the prize money building it, um, just because they were competitive and wanted to win, and there was so much attention right. and excitement around it. So it really is a pretty amazing model for getting people to solve problems that. And this is a key thing for the X Prize: getting people to solve problems that industry isn't already solving. So there's like that weird spot in the middle where it's like not right now; it's not lucrative enough for industry to go in and solve the problem. And I know they pulled one of their prizes because at first they thought they needed to incentivize, I'm forgetting now which one, Um, but it was something that then industry began addressing very, very quickly. And so they realized, oh, okay, like this isn't something that we have to solve. Industry is gonna take care of it. So it's things in that weird spot. So like cleaning up the ocean is Mm -hmm. a big one for them. Privatized space flight was a big one. Um, You know, and, and some of like, it's just, they're really trying to have a roadmap to really on a long term um, scale have positive impact. So one prize stacks on another prize stacks on another prize. So they've done multiple for cleaning up the ocean and things like that. Yeah. So it's it, it really pretty incredible. And Peter says in this episode that all problems are only contextually based. I love that. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about what he means by that? So people understand. Yeah, so he's talking about like, so his fundamental belief is that any problem is solvable, Mm -hmm. right? But like, that's an easy one to nod, mm -hmm, but it's like most people do not believe that, right? Right. So if you really believe that any problem is solvable, then the question becomes, how do we go out and solve those? And the reason that he believes that they're solved, and and I say that, by the way, because when you don't believe the problem is solvable, you don't take the steps, the actions to actually solve the problem. So, um, you know, hearing some of the great minds talk about global warming, it's like, they just believe it's solvable. They Like, there's this great meme where it's like, this person lists all the, like, things that would come from solving global warming. And somebody in the audience goes, but what if we create this amazing world and we're not actually responsible for the problem in the first place? And it's like, well, but you still created an amazing world. So it's like, right. what, what is there to push back against other than right now, there's so much money to be made in things that heat up the atmosphere. But when you take from the perspective that, or when you come from the perspective that Peter comes from, which is this problem is solvable, this is something that we can do. It can lead into an industry. Then you begin to take the steps to, to actually solve the problem. So desalination, I think, is, is the perfect example of a contextually based problem. So what ridiculous percentage of the earth is covered in water? It's like 60% or something? I mean, it's ridiculous. I think it's more. I, I think yeah. it is more. I'll be really yeah. conservative. It might be as high as 80, but yeah. let's pretend for a second that it's only 60. So the earth is essentially covered in water. We're considered a water planet. Um, but there's like it's like 1% of water or something that is um, drinkable, Mm -hmm. right? Because the rest has salt in it. So you don't have a water problem, you have a salt problem. Once you realize that's the truth, right? The context is, so people think we have a water problem, but really like once you understand that if you could easily pull the salt out, your water problem goes away. So water shortages are contextually based. We actually have a water with salt problem in that we're melting the polar ice caps, sea levels are rising. So it would actually be pretty amazing. Like if you could pull some of that water out, use it for things like irrigating, like what happens then, mm-hmm. right? So um, that, that desalination was the one that really made me go, 
whoa, like it's just, just a shift of context to really rethink the problem. And so aluminum used to be one of the most precious metals on earth because we didn't know how to like do the process of extracting it. I think it's electrolysis. It's something like that, that okay. actually does, um, makes it really easy to extract the metal, really inexpensive. But to give you an idea, the Washington Monument's actually capped with aluminum, the same thing that uh, you make your Coke cans out of. Hmm. So, because it was, it was considered so precious, it was like, look guys, with this new country, we're flushed with cash like so much that we can put aluminum on that yeah. and then you know whatever 30 40 years later it becomes like one of the most cheapest and ubiquitous metals ever and that's just con context right? right so once you have that process of extracting and it becomes dirt cheap so that peter's making a lot of bets on that and that's what planetary resources is all about is like okay there's like i think it's helium three so we actually have a helium shortage on earth. Like, did you know that? No. So, oh, this is like a couple years ago. I was trying to go like fill some balloons and the store was like, we're out of helium. And I'm like, okay. And like, is there like the next Ralphs? Do they have more helium? And they're like, no, like it is a global shortage. And I was what? like, what? Helium? <laughs> yeah. So, but like helium is like just ridiculously abundant on like asteroids, which who would have guessed? So yeah. if we can, create the technology and the devices to go and land on these asteroids and mine them. I think Peter said that there's like some that are between one and $10 trillion assets, the asteroids, depending on how like, because obviously as it becomes more available, it's going to be cheaper. So depending on sort of how you um, devalue it for its uh, availability. But that is like, that's dreaming big to me, right? That's, yeah. that's his abundant thinking. When he said that, that there are asteroids that are trillion dollar assets, I was like, what? Yeah, right? Like that how just, many zeros are in a trillion? That like, just blew my mind. And just yeah. like thinking about the the known universe in a completely different way. Yeah. It's like never would have even considered that that would be something we would want to do or that that had value. Right. And has so much value. So, so really, just for a second, um, let's pretend that we don't have an audience. And I just want to like, th the thing that excites me the most in life, what happens when you can get people to do two things. One, that they allow themselves to believe that they could acquire the skills to be capable of going and mining an asteroid, right? Think about like just like a random kid. Could be really yeah. bright, like who knows? Yeah. But they don't believe it. Like they don't believe that they're gonna be able to do that. And right. because they don't believe that, they don't, they just don't they take don't the try. steps, right? They don't yeah. go read about it. They don't go learn. They don't like start asking questions. And one of the, and I didn't recover it in this interview because I'd already covered it with Peter, but an, an interviewer once asked him, so he has this idea. We're going to mine these near earth asteroids. We're going to go huge assets. We're going to build the spacecraft that are needed to get there. And like the moment you say spacecraft, like people are like, <laughs> what the fuck? Like that's so audacious yeah. that most people are just going to shut down. And I think what people don't understand is Peter actually has an aerospace engineering degree from MIT. Right. Like this guy is so bright. <laughs> like he's so like, and you know me, I don't overvalue intelligence, right. but when you got it, it's like a nice addition. Sure. If you have a growth mindset, this dude is like crazy bright. And so he's like, okay, we can, you know, build these spaceships um, and just has the willingness to be that audacious. And the interviewer asked him, so, you know, um, how much money do you think you'll have to raise? Like, how are you going to be profitable? Like, how are you going to span the next 10 years before this is really viable? And Peter was like, we're already profitable. Because here's what makes Peter interesting. He goes, okay, I want to get to near earth asteroids, but I know that that's like a 10 year gap, right? Mm -hmm. To build the spacecraft and all that. But each piece of technology that we have to develop along the way is monetizable. And so he first created things that you can put into satellites and they look back at earth because he has to be able to identify what is the asteroid made of. But if you can point a sensor at an asteroid and say what it's made of, you can point it at the earth and say what it's made of. So you could point it at crops and say, what are those crops? And you could find out globally what's being planted um what's dying due to um you know like uh problems with the crops or whatever and so he was able to make the company profitable by using those sensors in other applications mm -hmm. and so the second part of my initial thing that i brought up which is okay so they allow themselves to believe and then what happens when they actually understand how to execute right so peter knows both he knows how to yeah. dream big which most people already they just don't know how to do that yeah. anyone right and this is my obsession anyone can learn how to do that so literally fundamentally those are the two problems that i want impact theory to solve 
most heavily focused on teaching people how to think, mm -hmm. how to dream, so and and how to believe. And I'm just realizing that's a huge part of our mission, getting people to believe that they can do it. Yeah. So what happens when you have, you know, whatever, the four new billion minds coming online? And, and quite frankly, 99% of the billion or the, the people that are already online don't believe in themselves, don't believe. They don't understand what the human animal is truly capable of. So what happens when they believe they can do it and then they actually learn how to execute? I think that, um, that like we're in one of these transitional moments. So Michio Kaku in his book, Future Physics, I think, God, will somebody please remind me to actually look up the title of the book? For some reason, I've become obsessed. And I read this like two years somebody ago. Somebody will put it in the comments. But yeah, sure. thank you. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, all of a sudden, I'm uh, this just keeps coming up. And he talks about how um, civilizations are basically tiered. I can't remember what word he uses, but uh, a stage five civilization can harness the power of a star. I think that's the stage that he has it at. And so it's like, I feel like we're on this cusp with AI, with nanotechnology, with all that stuff that's coming on board, that we're about to like level up from stage one to stage two or whatever stage we're at to go to the next one. And that to me is, is, I believe truly, truly, by the way, I truly believe impact theory, us, the people here, like we're gonna be able to help in our way with the mentality to help push us to the next stage as a, as a civilization. Yeah, and let's talk about that too because um, one thing you guys addressed in the episode was that there's a lot of fear around AI, there's a lot of fear around the yeah. technology and uh, Peter said that it's going to, there will be magnitudes of change um, in the coming decades. Yep. So how do we prepare for that? All right, so first and foremost, people have to understand what is gonna change to the best of our ability to predict it, because at some point it becomes unpredictable, but to the best of our ability, what are the things that are gonna change? And then really, really, really learn how to embrace change and get excited yeah. about change. And remember, you can change your mindset around anything. So let's say that you're one of those people, you're absolutely terrified of change, like you don't want anything to do with it. Um, you can flip a switch and find a way to get really into it. And, it, I'll give you the, like the baseline. The baseline, in fact, uh, Chase, as my resident note taker, I'm gonna write a book about how you build your mindset around things like this. So just like the, the actual process, um, that'll be interesting. So book one, getting out of the matrix. Yeah. Book two, um, how to do things like get yourself to like something that you don't currently like. Because mm. it, it is doable, by the way. And walking people through sort of the neuroscience and all that anyway. Um, it's incredibly powerful. It's an area that most people push back on. And this may be the thing that like impact theory filters for, right? Because I always say that I'm a filter. If I can get you to believe that you can change even fundamental things like that, like, um, God, what is a great example? Okay, my wife makes me eat this Manuka honey. Have you guys ever heard of it? I've actually right. tasted it. Okay, and it tastes like flowers. It tastes like a mouth full of flowers. Yeah. It is not pleasant in any way, shape, it's or form. It's got a licorice -y taste. Nope, because I love licorice. Okay. It tastes well, like a mouth full of flowers, my friend. Like, And my wife says the same thing. It tastes like licorice. If it tastes like licorice, like you'd have to knock the jar out of my hand because I love me some licorice. Like real licorice flavor. Like well, black so licorice. let's be really clear. Fennel. Licorice is a flavor. So there's no such thing as... Red licorice, black licorice, okay? Licorice is the black stuff, that's it. That's what I mean. Yeah. I wanted to make sure we were talking about the same thing. Yes. I wanted to define our terms. I, I get like, I feel such <laughs> a, a pride over licorice and I don't wanna like derail on this because it's like totally divisive, I had no idea. Like growing up as a kid, I ate it thinking everybody loves licorice, oh, yeah. only to find that one of my most beloved authors, Bill Watterson, the guy that did um, Calvin and Hobbes, likened it to writhing maggots. And I was, I was crestfallen because I felt betrayed. So I'm, yeah, I'm very defensive over licorice. That's funny. Um, but so Manuka honey, don't like it, but it's like from a, a I'm, I am totally obsessed with the microbiome and I think that I'm like going deep on the research on this. I think it's, I think it's so much bigger than we think it is. Mm. And I think really very few people are really looking at it to the level that they need to. And I believe that I have single-handedly allowed my wife to suffer more than she has needed to because I have not um, got a deep enough understanding of that. So I'm really going to go hard on that. And as I'm researching this and really learning about it, 
I realized Manuka honey is a very powerful um, source of probiotics, like naturally. Yeah. And so, like, I just had to flip a switch in my mind. I, I may not like the taste, like, okay, that's irrelevant, but I can get excited about eating it because I know what it's doing for me. So I'm focusing on that part that is so powerful and so useful and something I do in the gym. So with the gym, I hate working out. So some days I focus on, hey, man, you're a stud. Like, you're willing to do this thing that you hate. And then other times I'm like, I actually want to feel pleasure right now. So I'm going to focus on the results. I'm going to focus on what it's going to do to my strength, what it's going to do to my physique, my leanness, um, how I feel about myself, all that, right? So uh, both of those are very important. So. Uh, that'll be there's a preview of the book um nice. so that all of those things are possible so people need to really um learn to embrace that change i'm so proud of myself right now because i have not gotten lost in any of this yeah, you came back so that. um really like understanding that you can um pull that off like that's that's really important so you have to learn to embrace change change is going to be the scary part understanding where um what things are actually going to change what jobs are gonna go away, because that's the part that's gonna freak people out. So right. um, when the jobs go away, and jobs that like people aren't thinking about, like those are gonna go away, but there are people talking about this, so just you can start researching. Um, go to credible sources, because I'm sure there's a lot of inflammatory stuff. Peter's a great place to start. He writes about this a lot, very optimistically, and I think very truthfully. Um, drivers, gone. It's gone. If you're a driver right now, this, stop this video. And I don't often encourage people to do that. Stop mm. this video and go start acquiring other skills if you're a driver. Um, other like doctors gonna go away. It's gonna go away. Think about IBM Watson. Like if you're my doctor and I have to worry about what you did last night and like if it's like, did you sleep well? Like are, do you have any sort of mental fatigue? Um, do you know my entire history? Probably not, but IBM Watson could. And not only know my history, but know all the people like Facebook, their whole um, like audiences. Like who are people like Tom, right? right? And what have they suffered from? And like what reactions might he have that are unique to him that you'll have fed your DNA into it? You'll fed your DNA, you'll have fed your, the DNA of your microbiome and like a hey, viome. So this is now I'm going hard today on, Go um, on Impact Theory alumni. So two things while we're on Impact Theory alumni, Gary V has launched his new show. Go watch it. Planet of the Apps. It's fucking awesome. It's absolutely hilarious. He's so funny. He's classic Gary interrupting <laughs> people like every two seconds. Um, but his advice is unbelievable. And I really think he's going to be like the breakout star in that. And then Viome, which is a company founded by uh, another Impact Theory alum, Naveen Jain, who's looking at the RNA of the viruses. So in your biome, you should have um, viruses, fungi, and bacteria, mm -hmm. okay? Like, and I'm reading this book right now called The Human Superorganism, and it talks about how, bro, what you think of as you is a shell. Like, you're literally a, a car for bacteria, fungi, but seriously, That's like, 1% crazy. of the DNA wrapped in you, and it's not even in you, so much of it is on you, but in and on you, 1% is mammalian. One. And now, like, I'm at the part of the book where they're talking about, like, and by the way, there's this thing called gene transfer where genes can be actually, like, um, the hypothesis. And nobody's really sure to what extent it works with humans, but that um, genes can be transferred between organisms. And if that's true, how much of what we consider mammalian is actually mammalian and how much of it is bacterial and viral and fungal? Like, it's nuts. Wow. So I think we're at the precipice of really beginning to understand human beings. So... Anyway, like the big thing is you have to understand change. Doctors are going to go away. Uh, drivers are going to go away. Maybe teachers are going to go away. Like, like imagine a world in which education is like video games, right? And we've talked about this before. Right now, education is done in sort of a scarcity mindset. There can only be so many A's and we all have to go like at the same pace. Like that doesn't make sense. If you give 10 kids a video game, and say, hey, let's say it's a first person shooter. Um, you give it to all of them. Like, I remember the first time that I played a first person shooter. Do you know how spatially disorienting that was for me? Like, I literally, I, what is happening? And I was just getting killed over and over and over. Cause your brain has to myelinate. You have to figure out like, and one, I'm bad at spatial relations anyway. So like, I was just slower to learn that. But my friend, Chris Vanderpolder, mad shout out to that kid. Uh, 
he's so good at first person shooters. So anytime we'd play together, he'd just womp me. And so it's like, if, if that were the education, it's like, well, he's gonna go way faster in that than I'm, but I can get as good as him. I just have to put more time and practice. There's certain things that I have to get better at. So like, if you can make education like that so that no kid is left behind, that is all a test of execution. It's all about skills. So either you can pass the level or you can't, whatever the thing is, history, science, mathematics, doesn't matter. Like you're setting it up in a way where I get to the point where I can no longer do it anymore and then I fail. And just like in a video game, you die, you start over. And then you get a little bit farther because you're learning a new skill, you're figuring it out, you're assessing. Like once we can make education like that, like I don't know how a teacher like other than corralling people, like they're just not gonna be as good. And one thing my sister's doing, this is fucking interesting. And so, and I'm also making a huge bet um, here on chatbots. And my sister and I are talking about like, what are chatbots? What's the future of this gonna be? I'm trying to turn myself into a chatbot, which I think is very, very fascinating. And then my sister's trying to create educational chatbots so that like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, that you could literally have a conversation with um, Lincoln, with JFK, mm. um, you know, where you're taking all of this material, all that we know about them, even down to the point where you can get the chatbot. And this isn't today. I mean, this is going to take her 10 years to get there, but she'll, just like Peter, she'll start with something that's monetizable today and then it, it grows. But you would take in like his cadence, right? So the way that he talks and so the way that he talks would be different than the way that Lincoln talks. And uh, just could be incredible, especially if we can tap into the power of the crowd and do something like Wikipedia style. So anyway, she's working on that and working with some universities and stuff. It's pretty interesting. I'm in a good mood today. I'm feeling really energized. So I could keep going, but I'll stop. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's go to our audience here, our Facebook Live audience. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, just a reminder, we have a lot of giveaways today for our new merch, which is in the store, shop.impacttheory.com. Go check it out. Just launched today. Um, you can share this live feed if you're finding value in it and send a screen grab of that share to connect at impacttheory.com. You'll be entered to win an item of your choosing from the store. Plus, we have more coming very soon. But I want to um, go to a question from our Facebook Live audience because we have a lot of people asking questions. Nice. Uh, first, let's do some shout outs, though. We got Ivana Gadient from Maui. Maui we got in the house. Adele Agoram from Montreal. And we have Zanette Georgia Nicolas Zorzos from Whoa. Greece. There it is. Yeah. Should have guessed. Should have guessed. <laughs> um, Yasu de Gumnis. Cool. So here is a question from Joshua Martel. Our boy. Yeah. 3D Pop Designs. Mm -hmm. My man. He says there was a scene in Star Trek First Contact where there was a pivotal point in history where something needed to happen for the history of Star Trek to happen. I just wonder, what are the things that we are doing today that are those pivotal points in history that are do or die that moves us toward the future? Any thoughts from Tom? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't think there are any do or die moments. I think that history is or um, life is sort of like a living organism, like... You know how people say anything happens for or everything happens for a reason? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. But I do believe that meaning can be extracted from anything. So whatever happens will rebound. We're such a resilient species. Um, yeah. So I, I think that the stream of life will go where it's going to go. It'll meander. It'll be influenced by beautiful things that happen, terrifying things that happen. Um, but think about it. Like the, the plague, the Spanish flu of 1918. Like most people don't even talk about it. It happened right after World War I. So World War I kills millions of people. It's just utterly devastating. And then the Spanish flu comes along and kills something like 10 times more people than died in the war. Nobody ever talks about it. Like people were just so like they couldn't handle any more talk about death. Yeah. And so eh, like I didn't hear about the Spanish. Flu. I knew about World War One. Right? right. We can all agree about that. Right. But I made it until I was probably in my early 30s before I heard about the Spanish flu of 1918. So, I mean, it's crazy. It's so, but something like that, which killed, it ki like it, it measured like on the, per it killed something like 2% of the global population. I mean, it's, that's a lot, my friend. Yeah. And people don't even know about it. Hmm. You know, like think about the plague, um, the bubonic plague that hit London. It decimated the population, decimated and took it from, it was ridiculous. It took it, i um, making these numbers up, but emotionally it felt something like, I feel like Trump right now with some alternate facts, but <laughs> like it did something like take the population of um, London from like 2 million down to like 600,000. I mean, it was just ridiculous. It just went through with a scythe and just yep. killed, killed, killed. So, but you bounce back. 
no sense of it today, right? Like yeah. none of us worry about it. So there will be catastrophic things that happen. Global warming, right? We're gonna lose the Maldives. Peace, right? It's just gonna happen. Venice is already sinking. It's crazy. Like there are already towns where like the water's coming up and over. We're probably gonna lose like 60% of Manhattan. It's not gonna end the world. So these are all terrifying things, by the way, and I think we should do everything we can to stop them. But in terms of what do I think are do or die, I don't think there are do or die moments. Um, you said that you don't believe that everything happens for a reason. Correct. Um, in the episode, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, you'll probably see I do this a lot. I pick up on little like sort of throwaway comments that the Smart. guests make because Best. they always fascinate me the most. And he said something about, um, he was talking about like the difference between successful people and unsuccessful and saying that, you know, the successful people, they have drive, they have grit. Um, they have better experiences to draw upon because um, they've you know done things and worked on those right. and perhaps a little bit of luck along the way. Do you believe in luck? A hundred percent. One hundred percent. And uh, dude, like, so first of all, luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. So you have to be prepared. And so an infinite amount of luck passes people by all the time. So I don't focus on the luck part. I focus on being ready for it. Mm. But there is no question luck, serendipity, like whatever you want to call it, like is very real and you need to be very ready to capitalize on it. And I just really believe like if you focus on, and there's a quote by Larry Bird and he said, I have a theory. If you show up every day and give 110%, things are going to work out okay. That's a paraphrase, but that gives you an idea. I love that. Like a hundred percent. Like if you show up every, I'm just trying to be great, dude. I'm trying to be fucking great. And when I look back, so there's a few areas in my life, I am literally trying to be world-class. Okay. One of which is interviewing. I am, I am in no uncertain terms, I'm trying to be the globally recognized heavyweight champion at interviewing, period. Now I have my reasons for that. Won't go the, into them here, I've been capped in tangent today, but that's like really important to me. Now because of that, like, and this isn't something I can really like give people a sense of, but when we started this, um, I had like a billion dollar brand behind me, I felt like, like the, the company at least like was visible, even if people didn't know who I am. And I would be sitting across from people interviewing them and I would like a huge part of what I had to do was get them to take me seriously because they had no idea who I was. They didn't know the company, they didn't know me. It was like Christopher stalked them and got them on the show. Like he worked his magic, but they literally, they had no context. And so I had to like, in a few minutes before they go on, like I try to give them context so that they would show up and play, right? Because that's the big thing. Like. People sleepwalk through the interview if they don't yeah. like know who you are. Yep. So, and now my friend, now my friend, literally I have guests when I start doing the like context setting, they're like, you don't have to tell me your story. I know who you are. And that's like, whoa, like what a change. And it's a change because I'm trying to be great. And so now because of that, like we're getting luckier, right? We're getting people on the show that we wouldn't have been able to get, but I, I don't fool myself into thinking that it's not still timing. Like they were available. They were coming through LA. Um, that they, how did they see that first show? Christopher was able to get them on the phone. Like there's a thousand pieces that we can't control that had to come together for that moment to happen. Right. But it came together and then I fucking delivered, right? And that's the, like, that's the big thing. So think about Gary Vee. That was a big win for us, right? Been trying forever to get him on the show. Literally, I think over a year. Yeah. Trying to get him on the show. Almost happened once, and then his schedule fell apart. And by the way, his schedule fell apart as code for he didn't give a shit, right? Which I don't take personally, by the way. Like, rightly yeah. so. He's got to judge, like, who are the right people for me to allocate my time and energy to? Like, you have to be relentless with that stuff. So I don't take it personally, but like, I get it. I wasn't a priority at the time, so um, it didn't happen. But it was like, did I deliver an interview? Yes or no? And I did, right? So, and people wrote in the comments and I recognized it on set. I was like, yeah, bitches. <laughs> like, I was so prepared for that interview that, and, and prepared in like a thousand ways. I knew Gary's story, right? But that to me is like, you shouldn't be doing an interview if you don't know somebody's story. So I know a story very well. To me, that's just like the ante. Every interviewer should know that. But then I've done a thousand things to prepare mentally, emotionally. Um, like, don't be a vampire, right? I see interviewers do that a lot. Like they're trying to ride on the... And you can see me in my early interviews trying to be a vampire. Like trying to ride on their energy, trying to show up and like show, like, look at me, look at me. Right. And 
So getting to the point where I didn't do that so that I could give Gary an interview that he loved so that then he would talk about it, right? For his own reasons. Like that's how you take advantage of luck. You be insanely prepared, but don't fool yourself. There's a massive amount of luck in all of this. The timing at Quest. Without the timing, if we tried to, the same three people tried to do the exact same thing now, it wouldn't work. Timing. Yeah. Totally lucky on that. I, I got pissed off with chasing money at exactly the right moment. What if I'd gotten pissed off two years later? The window would have been gone. So it was like, luck. All right. That's great. Um, I'm with you on that, full, uh, 100%. Let's, uh, let's go to our Facebook Live audience. Just a reminder, here we are on After Impact. This is the episode where we go deep into the episode of Impact Theory. We're discussing Peter Diamandis today. If you haven't seen the episode, it's a really fascinating one, and it's a, it's a follow-up from the original Inside Quest episode with Peter Diamandis, which is also great. Um, we are giving away all kinds of new merch because our store just launched. So I have a question for our audience. Peter says there are three things, and this is um, around the time when he's talking about his kids um, and how to instill greatness in them. And there are three things that people need in order to be successful. If you know what those three things are, put them in the comments right now and you will be entered to win an nice. item of your choosing from the store. And let's okay. go to That's another good. question from yeah. our audience. So this one is from Zanette, who we got a shout out from. And do Chris. we really have a lot of questions? Like, should we try to do some rapid fire? Uh, we can, yeah. All right, let's do rapid fire. All right. Keep this, this is a long question, for, so we'll see, if, we'll see how far we can get. Peter is worried that he isn't able to impact his kids the way his dad impacted him through mm. being a survivor. What is a modern-day equivalent to that form of survival? Only because where we are right now is so abundant in information and opportunities, but increasingly lacking the right type of mindset or tools to deal with all the techno technological advancement cacophony. Um, I can only tell you this, that if I had kids, the strategy that I would use um, lead by example, they need to see me suffer. They need to see me being willing to suffer. And I think suffering is hugely important. So they need to see the amount of effort that I put in. They need to see moments like me playing my flu game where I have the flu legitimately, I'm on my ass and I still get up, I do the research, I fucking write the intros um, and I do two interviews back to back on the same day. Whenever you're like really sick, you have three days that are absolute hell. And of course, Day two and day three of the hell were prep and performance. Yeah. So it was a nightmare. They need to see that. And I think that then getting them in situations where they have to suffer. And I've heard cool things. I think it was from Angela Duckworth, the author of Grit, where if her kids sign up for something, they don't force them to. But if you sign up for ballet, your ass is doing it for a year. No if, ands, or buts. So if you want to quit, too bad. You can quit at the end of the year. Yeah. But you're like, once you're in, you're in for a year. I love that. Things I, like I do that. I too. I like that. Um, let's see another question. This is from Jay Velasco. Hello from Orange County. Where do you think AI is going to make the greatest impact? Medicine, health, 100%. Cool. There you have it. From Corey G. Rhoda, where do you feel the workforce will shift to after AI becomes a larger factor? I haven't thought enough about it to give you a really intelligent answer, but humans have a way of finding the gaps. So we're going to fill the gaps. And God, if I could just beg everyone to follow your bliss. So wherever that takes you, whatever hole opens up, um, fill that. And please, 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 like, don't think because you've always done it one way or that you have a current frame of reference based on your age when you grew up and all that stuff, that that's how it has to be. Like, get out of that. Start using Snapchat. Start, like, take the five things that you find most ridiculous about kids and engross yourself. Go in, fall in love. I was so paranoid about social media when it first came out that I lied, excuse me, about my birth date on Facebook. I was just convinced someone was gonna steal my identity. And so I, I lied about it, literally with that fear. And now I'm like, all I do all day is social media because I'm very um, happy to change my context whenever needed to stay fresh. Cool. Um, there's a lot of questions in here I'm actually noticing now that are about jobs and AI. Let's do it. Let's go into all of them. Uh, what skills should we learn if jobs are going to get replaced by AI? All right. The, the big thing is... Um, really learning how to adapt. So understanding the way that the human mind can adapt and going out and I think one of the things that we have to realize now is 
certainly every 10 years reinvent yourself. And that's something that people just don't do. I think that's probably going to shorten a little bit. Maybe it gets to seven, six years. Like it's going to crush down. And so people have to have the framework. Like I know how to learn. I know how to begin the very big and arduous process of learning like the microbiome is gigantic, right? And with the tools that we have today, oh my God, like it's so easy. It's offensive when people are paralyzed. Like, I don't know where to start. Y-O-U-T-U-B-E dot com. Drop into the search box, the fucking term. Drop in microbiome and then pick the one that looks most like a cartoon, most like it's aimed at a child. Start there. You begin to get the terms. The terms you don't understand, actually hit pause. Go look them up. Like I remember, so I wanted a bigger vocabulary. So what did I do? Fucking read Clive Barker because that man's vocabulary makes me want to punch him in the head. It is so amazing and it makes me feel so badly about myself. And I would highlight the word and because I didn't want to like totally fuck up my flow. If I could get the gist from the, the sentence, I would just move on. If I couldn't, I would look it up right then. So I carried Clive Barker and I carried a dictionary. This is like pre-cell phones, kids. So I had those two with me wherever I went. And like if I was on the subway or something, then I would be reading highlight look up the ones I had to, and then at night, I would have the discipline before I went to bed. I would look up every word that I'd highlighted and I would write down what it meant. And like, that's how you expand your vocabulary. So you literally go through, do that, learning how to learn. That's, I'll stop there. There's so much more, but let's go to the next but What's question. your, I want to dive in a little bit deeper here. What is your process? I just want to point out that Jared is fucking up the rapid fire. Yeah, you could Not say me. fucking it up or actually enriching <laughs> this discussion. I think you However are. you want to look at All it. All right, enrich, enrich um, away. What is your process right now for studying the microbiome? Like, okay, so um, first- For learning yep. about it. So I went on audible.com and I looked up books that had amazing, a lot of reviews and amazing reviews. So 4.5 to five stars um, and making sure that they have, man, if they have north of a thousand reviews, like you almost can't lose. And so finding a book that just had a lot of reviews, really high rating, sounded like it was exactly what I wanted to know. Um, and then I went in. So any book that has like, I, I don't remember how much, this, maybe this one only had 150, I don't remember. But any book that has like a lot of reviews on a, even a really big topic means that it's accessible to the masses. That's key. Because some people can write for the masses and some can't. Sure. So um, <clears throat> that, that was big. So I started in that book. And then I would just hit pause. Like every time he said something I didn't understand, and I would look it up and sometimes I'd watch like entire videos on it um, on, so this book is going to take me forever to read let's just start there because there's so much information and I don't understand like he would say organelle and I'm like what the fuck is an organelle and so I'd have to go look that oh okay I get it right and he'd be like um organisms are broken into three types and like you're there and, huh, 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 huh. and I'd have to go look up each one but like when you're not afraid to be ignorant and I am I'm just not afraid to be ignorant. So, because that's how you empower yourself. So, okay, cool. I don't understand that. This seems like sh I should probably understand it. And there were things that I looked up and then realized like he just moved on from it. And it was like, oh geez, I didn't really need that right now. Eh, but you can't take that knowledge away. Now I've got it. Yay. I'm taking copious notes. And then I'm literally every morning. So when I eat my breakfast, I let myself watch something I want to watch on YouTube. So um, a lot of times it's, you know, inspiring videos or something about marketing or whatever. Now it's just all microbiome. Mm -hmm. So um, this morning while I was eating my chips, I'm watching, you know, videos on the microbiome and just trying to figure it out. And I really do start with like now I've gotten to the point where I don't need the cartoony ones anymore. But like I started there and now I'm like, so at first I literally put it microbiome. And so you're going to get the most generic, most basic. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that the microbiome videos all have a loop. Just like in an interview, I'm trying to find the person's loop. When do people start repeating themselves? Mm -hmm. So I hear the same thing over and over. So I watch a bunch of videos. I find the loop of like the really basic, what's the microbiome? And they talk about how you have some in your gut and some in your mouth and mm -hmm. some in your skin. And that's like sort of the basic loop and that they work in conjunction with us and that we're actually only 1% of our DNA is mammalian and 99% is bacterial, fungal, and viral. And okay, like I got that loop now. Yep. So now I've added microbiome research. Now research is like one of those heavy words. I know it's gonna take me upstream. So, and I'll just keep refining my searches longer and longer tail. Uh, maybe there'll be a concept that really jumps out to me. Also, I wanna find out where's the friction, like where are scientists disagreeing? I'm not there yet. I know that's where I'll get in the future. Like right now- That's my next question. What do you do when that happens? Well, then you have to develop a worldview. You have to, you have to come to, because here's like, and this is something that I'm on a tear on socially. Like 
If you actually want to get ahead, you need to have a real worldview, like where you believe certain things and you don't believe others, right? If you're just chasing somebody, you'll never be as good as them because they're going to go somewhere counterintuitive and you'll be like, whoa, I never would have guessed they would say that. But because they have like this instinct, they've got a worldview, there's something inside them, just tell, they'll hear something and go, that doesn't ring true. Like everything that I know, and they're willing to trust their gut and push in that direction and at least learn and maybe they end up being wrong, but like they're willing to go down that path. So you can't handle the friction until you really know like what is, I understand how this works. Like I get the functioning of this. And so the example I'll give, so um, the medical device company, Neurovalens that I've gotten involved with, um, my whole thing was like, they're pitching me this device and they're talking about how it uses the vestibular nerve to um, trigger weight loss. And I'm like, whoa, like I've never heard that before. So now they're outside my worldview, right? And so they're explaining like, here's why we think it works, that the body basically is like an iPhone. It just has sensors. Um, it doesn't count calories, which is true about the body, by the way. The body doesn't track how many calories you've taken in. So it's like, wait a second, if the body doesn't know how many calories I've taken in, like how does it determine whether to up ramp metabolism or not? And so their whole thing is movement and the vestibular nerve tracks movement. So if that's true and like, you know, it's, it's, it's basically zapping you and telling your vestibular nerve, wow, I'm like moving all over the place. Like don't store fat, lean body mass. That's all we need. And so as he's saying it, I'm like, okay, wait a second. Now you've clicked into my worldview because the only thing I know that's associated with exercise um, beyond fat loss is anxiety and depression. So now, right now, all of a sudden, and this is where I think they decided they wanted to be involved with me, was I said, wait a second, if that's true, then this should impact anxiety and depression. And they were like, that's exactly where the research is now. But that's just me going, I know how something works. I, and, and by that, I mean, I know there's some correlation, even though I don't know what it is, and I can't even say that it's causation, but I know there's some correlation between being active and being fit anxiety and depression, right? You just read the literature. People yeah. are gonna tell you, hey, you're feeling anxious and depressed? Go fucking work out. And, and I see it in myself, I feel it in myself, so I know that it's real from an experiential standpoint. So once you've got a broad enough understanding and you trust yourself, then you find these moments where it clicks and you're like, I actually know how this works. And sure. once you have that, then when you find the friction in the science, you, you may be wrong, but you'll pick a side, right? Yeah. And you go, okay, I think, I think this is interesting. And then the really, really important part, once you pick a side and you're getting real cocky and you really think you understand it, this is where we separate the men from the boys. Can you fear dogma more than you fear anything else? So once I pick a side, I'm like, I want to read the things that argue against this. Like, so for instance, I'm a meat eater and I really believe, I really believe from a health standpoint, that it's imperative. And I get it, it's terrible for the environment. Terrible, but it's good for the human. I really believe that, and I've seen the effects on my own life. So when I'm do researching the microbiome and I come across a vegan video and the vegan is essentially making fun of people that eat meat and like, how crazy, and this study shows, and like, how could you even eat meat after a reading? And it's like, I have the same impulse everybody else has. Oh, this crazy woman, what does she know? Like, right. silly vegan. And then I'm like, wait a second, what if she's right? Like really open yourself to that. Like, would I not be prepared to change? Of course I would. Like, I don't need to eat meat. I only eat meat because I think it's advantageous, but I am very open to being wrong. So you have to open your mind to that. Now, if I'm not convinced it's not compelling, like that's a whole nother thing, but to shut your mind off to it, and you have to train yourself to feel that impulse. Like I felt the impulse to turn the video off and go to something else, and I thought, this is, this is how you screw yourself. And so I was like, cool, I recognize that impulse. I'm gonna in through my nose, out through my mouth, and I'm for a second, I'm gonna sit at this woman's feet and I'm gonna find out in what way she knows more than me and what way she's superior to me. I'm gonna learn from her and I'm gonna learn with an open mind. I'm gonna want it to change me. And then if it doesn't, it doesn't. But like, if you can really put yourself in that state where it's like, for the next, whatever, 10 minutes of this video, I really want her to be right because it would be a new piece of information that'll move me forward. Right. Um, that is so important and so few people do that. But then at some point you have to still make the decision. Like You have I, to go with I what I you actually believe. Yeah, I don't believe this, okay. Awesome, all right. Um, wow, we are r rapidly running out of time today. Do we have a winner from, our, from the comments? Jumani Cabrera. Jumani Cabrera. Jumani, our boy from Tacoma, first of all, let's talk about that. 
And then second, like he's an early adopter. Jumani's been with us for a while and he let us brutalize his name. We, we probably still are, but from what we can tell in his phonetic um, yeah. typing, that we're at least closer. I think we're closer. Um, he let us brutalize his name for, for a very long for time. For weeks and weeks. Yeah. Um, and he's always active in the comments, so we appreciate it, Jumani. You've just won any item from the store that you want. Um, get in contact with us, send us a message at Connected Impact Theory, and we'll make that happen. And you had a question, so we'll go ahead and ask that right now. Nice. Peter talked about the three things that he focuses on. Um, this is the answer to the question to instill in his kids. Passion slash self-learning, um, curiosity, and grit. What do you think of that strategy for teaching others? I think it's brilliant. Um, and I think that Peter's probably, and I haven't spent enough time thinking about it. I reserve the right to change my mind later. But it sounds to me on the surface like he's nailed it. That yeah. that's like the fundamental, that's the foundation. And if you can get that, um, that that really will work. And to me, it's, it's about that. It's about boiling it down to the physics. Like what are the physics of the human condition? I think he's got his finger on the three. If you can get like self-directed learning where you just care, you're excited. No one has to tell me to play video games. I love playing video games. Nobody has to tell me to read. I love reading. Um, and like with the microbiome, I've become obsessed because it's a problem in my life. Like my wife suffers because I have not solved this problem. It's all my fault. Like we know my whole stance. So like, it's not going to solve itself. I've got to go in and I've got to learn and I've got to have the willingness to believe I'm going to figure something out that other people haven't that, um, yeah, like the arrogance of belief. So yeah. Which one would you tackle first? Grit. And how? I don't know. He's got an interesting strategy, which is just to repeat to them. Like, what's the one thing we don't do? We don't give up. Mm -hmm. Now there's an advanced class element there. You have to know when to give up. And I wrote a whole article about that, but, um, as like a, a foundational element, that's really, really important. And then I just come back to lead by example, like for them to see him so excitedly and so doggedly pursue things. And Peter mm, Goggins is the grittiest person I know. But in terms of a, a business application, Peter's the grittiest person I know. It's what, like when you really hear his whole story, it is unbelievable. And it's not a surprise that this guy has gotten to where he's gotten in life. I mean, he is, he is tenacious. Like he just, he went to somebody at the FAA, dude, and they were just shutting him down, shutting, because he wanted to um, get zero G flight. Mm -hmm. And so the parabolic arcs, which I've done, it is, it is transformative. I, we all know I have not yet done psychedelics. If I had to guess, um, this is the closest thing to that where it, it shifted my perspective so rapidly and beautifully that I was for like two hours afterwards, I was in an altered state. It was unbelievable. But anyway, he wanted to bring that to people and the FAA told him, no, it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And he told the woman, you'll retire before I give up. And he literally outlasted her. He kept going and finally got it approved. And now it's like a whole business and, um, yeah, it's amazing. And that's Peter in a nutshell. Yeah. And speaking of his, um, his background and, and how he grew up, he says in the episode, you know, he studied medicine because that's what his parents wanted him to do. He got his diploma and then went and did something else. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just wonder what, what advice would you have for people who, and this happens to all of us. I think you get a lot of pressure, either familiar or familial or from someone else to go in, down a certain path to pursue a certain right. career and it may not be right for you. He kind of found a compromise within his family. Um, is that is that the right strategy? No, I think it's pretty dumb. Um, it's so sweet of him, and I get it. In a Greek family, like the amount of pressure is pretty overwhelming. TV, 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 anybody, anybody. Um, so the amount of pressure really is overwhelming to um, be a good boy, to make your parents proud and happy. And uh, so I like get it, but I just really think, man, the sooner you find that, the sooner you find the thing that makes you come alive, like how much farther ahead could Peter have been? Because he doesn't use his degree for anything. And maybe it helps him with like the longevity stuff that he's doing. And so maybe he's found that way to sort of rationalize it. Um, but he wasn't paying attention like he could or should because that's just, that wasn't his passion. Yeah. And I just think that passion is the thing that gives you the energy to keep fighting the focus and all of that. 
Um, I think you need to be so confident and comfortable in who you are that people will accept you. And I think that it is such a dangerous game to try to please other people because 99.999% of the world, um, and, and I'll say maybe in middle age, you get so fed up and like a couple of your friends die and you realize like, what am I doing? And you wake up at 45, 50 years old. But that, that to me is, um, is tragic. Mm. So the earlier that you can say, I don't, I love you, mom, I love you with all of my heart, but I don't care what you think about my life. So I'm going to do what makes me feel alive. I'm going to follow my bliss and I'm going to be compassionate and empathetic towards you and your situation and all the fears that make you worry for me. Um, but I'm certainly not going to let that dictate my life. It is patently absurd to me. Yeah, I actually have some experience with this in, in my own life. And I thought at the time that it was going to you know, cause a big problem in my family. But now it's, it's not a big deal at all. But when I was in college, I was studying. I went in to study business and economics mm. because I was kind of like, yeah, I'm sort of interested. I don't really know what I want to do yet. Right. And I was minoring in English. And there was a point at which I was just like, I'm having so much more fun. And I'm so much more passionate about my English classes than my business classes. And I was at that stage where I needed to like fully get into the major or right. do something different. And I was fortunate enough that my parents are amazing and they were um, funding my, my, my tuition. And I told them, I remember calling them and I said, um, I'm going to switch my major to English. And they just thought, they, there was just a long silence on the phone. And they thought that they were outraged they thought that was mm -hmm. the stupidest idea you're not you're not going to get a job like what are you going to do teach and my mom's a teacher and she was like you shouldn't do that for your career path and uh they said well if you do that we're not going to support you anymore in college wow and i said do what you need to do i'll pick up part-time jobs and do what i need to do but this is important for me that actually makes me want to cry that's so weird like that's so powerful to me like what a fucking amazing story that you found yourself stood up to that, did what, like, do what you've got to do, man. I'm, I'm really moved by that. That's fucking powerful. And the, I'm almost certain you've told me that story before, um, but it's hitting me anew again. That is incredible. That's guts. But here's the best part about the story is like, I'm sure I came off as a, as a jerk at that time to my parents, but I, like a year or two ago, I was talking to my mom about it and she said, you know, when you did that, I was kind of, I was very worried for you because they just wanted the best for me, right? Right. Um, and I was kind of, I was really upset with you. But then when I got off the phone, I was like, that kid has some guts. Yeah. And she's like, 100%. you earned a lot of respect with me. And so it was like, it, it all worked out in the end right. is what is what I was trying to get at. But um, yeah. And just, this is going to be a little indulgent because I'm sure we're out of time. But you actually have a really awesome business mind. Like you're, vi I'm so curious to see where you continue to go in the company. Cause it's like, you're really good at the organizational, like you're a phenomenal manager. Like, you know how to rally people, get them pointed, like to help them see like a path. Like it's really fun. I'm so grateful. And you know, I've talked about this, so I'm not like, um, surprising you with any of this, but like, I'm really, really impressed with that side of your personality. So you could have like, I mean, finished the business thing and crushed it, but it's interesting that you recognize that about yourself. And here's something that's important for people to hear and understand. Like, he's still good at that stuff. Like, whether you went to English class or not, like, you've recognized things as being important. You've put the time and effort into getting good at them. Uh, and so now you can execute on both. Like, you're very creative. And, um, you know, I guess Thank it's you. not a mistake that you're at a media company. and But at the same time, you're able to play a bunch of different roles, which to me is the definition of an entrepreneur. Like, somebody who thinks like an entrepreneur. They're not just saying, well, but that's not my role. Like, you're never, like, you never stay in your lane. I fucking love that so much. I admire that. I think it's amazing. Thank so you. respect to your uh, parents for giving you a crucible to make it through. I think that's yeah. awesome. And and the and the in the end, my parents still supported me, which is that's okay. the ultimate like even better. I really appreciate that, and that will that will always I will always be grateful to them for that. Um, all right, let's let's wrap it up here. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I just want to remind everyone. Uh, we just launched our new merch in the store, so go check it out. Shop at shop.impacttheory.com. Um, we're also going to be giving away some more, so you can share this live feed and send us a screen grab. 
If you want to wear your shirt, your Impact Theory shirt, if you have one, hashtag Impactivist, put it on social, um, put the link in your post to shop.impacttheory.com. Help us share about these, this new merch out there, and we will also give you enter you to win an item from the store. If you don't have a shirt and you just want to like let everyone know that, hey, Impact Theory's got some, got some stuff up there. We got some mugs. We got some posters. The posters are, are sick. I don't think you've seen them. I haven't seen yeah, them. Yeah. Um, check out the posters. We'll, nice. We're going to get some samples in here soon. All right. So let's do a couple more questions. Um, oh, I have one more announcement. This is from uh, intern Molly McClary. Molly Percocet. And what is up? LC. They, uh, LC just put up a blog post. This is where all everyone on the Impact Theory team, I don't know if it's everyone, but a lot of us are sharing about our thoughts on the story relaunch, our thoughts on what the Impact Theory shirt means to us. Nice. Um, and empowering narratives. Love that. And somebody has their hands in front of their face, so maybe I... <laughs> okay. Okay. So... We're sharing some stuff there about what impact theory means to us. Go check that out. And then let's do a couple questions. All right. This is from Tiffany Farrington. What diet slash lifestyle changes have you made as a result of your microbiome slash gut health research? Um, none yet. So the changes that I made were from before. So at Quest, we were going really hard on the microbiome. So in fairness, like I did have a, a decent base from that. Um, so that's where the Manuka honey came from, um, bananas, like, and pieces, kids. Like, I don't dive in on a whole banana, nature's candy, um, <laughs> but like a piece of a banana, um, you know, once or twice a week, like a teaspoonful of Manuka honey. I'm not like dropping it in my tea and like there's, it's sugar. Um, so I still like avoid that, but, um, so yeah, I haven't diversity is the thing that I really think about a lot with the microbiome, just getting, um, things. The biggest change I've made isn't even to my diet. And this is going to freak people out. Like I used to be germ phobic and I would carry, um, hand sanitizer with me mm. wherever I went. I've actually put, that. I've put hand sanitizer on my lips before. Oh, like if I felt like I touched something and Oh God, what am I doing? Like, like if somebody was sick, like yeah. Yeah, that's like obsessive and, uh, realizing, and this is critical, like understanding that if you have obsessive behavior, it's a neurological condition. You can unwind that shit. Now, if you have a truly pathological condition, I get it. Go seek help. All that. Like OCD is like a real thing. Like yeah. that's not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking sort of just, you've like built it up in your own mind. And so I was like that with hand sanitizer. And then I realized like, dude, like so, some huge percentage of the bacteria that you encounter is advantageous and so to be creating this sterile environment for yourself is the problem like it is the problem so now i wash my hands a lot less mm. and um as somebody who used to be like really skeeved out by that like i get it like that's super weird um but yeah like if i used to wash my hands no be i used to wash my hands until they'd crack and bleed Ooh. yeah so that was the scary level that yeah. we were on um, because I hate being sick more than I can tell you and realizing now I'm creating problems for myself by doing that. That was probably like the biggest fundamental where that was like a core part of my identity was being germ free, not, um, getting sick, like all of that. And really just embracing that. Okay. Look, if I get sick, it is what it is, but to have my, um, microbiome be so out of whack because I'm so sterile, like I think there's longevity issues there, and I think that it only exacerbates and gets worse. So I actually fantasize, not real. I mean, we have a little bit of dirt in our yard, but it's like I actually think about going and playing on a farm, like touch yeah. dirt, like get dirt on you, like uh, pull a carrot out of the ground and just eat it, like with dirt, like brush it off and eat it. Yeah. Like don't go wash it. Like I think there's probably some pretty serious advantages to that. Cool. All right. Well, I think we should wrap it up there. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today and letting us go hard on pimping our store. We yeah. appreciate that. Uh, also, let us know, by the way, if there's something you want to see in the store that's not already there. Um, we're all about it. Th these are still very early days. We're going to continue making that more and more robust. Um, but yeah, let us know what you want to see in there. This is a weekly show. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And by the way, thank you guys all. We are growing so fast. It yeah. is 
crazy town. We are so grateful. And just remember that you empower us to do more and more amazing stuff. The bigger the numbers, the easier it is to get amazing guests, so on and so forth. Um, so that really, really helps. And if you believe in our mission and actually think that we can have global impact on that mentality that we were talking about earlier, um, we need the followers because that's in today's social influencer age, the follower count is all that matters. Um, to everybody that leaves comments, by the way, this community is so engaged. Like we're, we're insanely grateful. And I spend a lot of my time. I spend hours a day, every day. There, I mean, there are exceptions. Like when I had the flu, fuck everybody. Like I didn't care about anything but sleep. <laughs> like that was so painful. Yeah. But like barring that seven days a week, I'm spending time answering questions, responding to comments. I don't take a single one of them for granted. So thank you guys. I'm telling you, I hope you guys feel it. This community is unlike anything out there on the web. Like it's just crazy. And we're starting to be recognized for that. Like people get it. They understand that we're doing something special. That is all you guys. We're just scary grateful. We talk about you behind your back all the time uh, about what we're building, about how grateful we are. And there's so many people in the community that are so active. We know who you are. We think about you. We talk about you by name. Some of you have some crazy ass screen names, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we are very grateful. So thank you guys all so much. And until next time, be legendary, my friends. Take care.